So welcome to the uh, latest episode, uh, episode of Gale Fire Fire Radio. Um, we're at What the Helicon, and we have kidnapped... Uh, Wait, can you say that on the podcast? What? Kidnapping? Yes. Kidnapping is what I was referring to. Yes. We have kidnapped uh, Philip here, who is... We haven't kidnapped him, he's our companion. <laughs> yeah, that works. Yes. Our new companion... Um, <laughs> For this episode of GPR, where we interview um, fans of Doctor Who, um, I am your host, David Beauchamp. I am joined by Drew Meyer, and we have Philip Wright. Okay, <laughs> no relation to Barbara Wright. No, but that did not miss my attention when I first <laughs> saw Barbara Wright. I was like, of course, that has to be a Wright in the first episode. Auntie Barbara. So, how did you first? Uh, how were you first introduced to Doctor Who? Completely by chance. Uh, I was a little kid watching PBS, and PBS. this was during the 80s, during the reign of Peter Davison as the fifth doctor, and I was introduced uh, to the tail end of an episode that had Omega as the, uh, the villain. We were seeing Omega from the old antimatter universe slowly revert back to his uh, antimatter form, and I had no idea what, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> I had no idea what the show was about. And then I managed to, at a later point on PBS, uh, start catching other episodes of Tom Baker, uh, along with John Berkeley, and I slowly got sucked in. Actually, it was a PBS uh, short, almost, uh, what they had before, they had Doctor Who Confidential, they had short PBS specials that kind of explained what Doctor Who was about, and that kind of gave me an idea as to why the show I was watching constantly had different actors for the main protagonists. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been useful to have seen that as a growing up as a kid. I know, yeah, my PBS station didn't have that. I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue that, that I, I remember watching Doctor Who and going, gosh, it seems like a Doctor Who episode, but they've never shown the Doctor. Because I was exactly. kept expecting Tom Baker to show up. Exactly. And it was actually through one of those specials that I first learned about the Daleks, because I did not see the Daleks until quite yeah. a few episodes. I, I had seen quite a few episodes later. And I think the first Dalek episode I saw was Death of the Daleks, which was the Pertwee. Or that's one of the earliest ones I remember. And I never knew they were such a big deal until later on. They were just yeah. another one of those monsters of the week Absolutely. for me. No, no clue when I saw them the first time. None. Because yeah, it's not until I saw the Hartnell era that I realized that they were in the second serial. Yeah, I know. That's how they, they are the first monster. Because I mean, really, the, the, the first serial, the monster, it, it's introducing the time travel aspect and your antagonists are cavemen. Yeah. It's well, let's face it, our very first serial or antagonist is the Doctor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, he, he is as much grumpy old grandfather as, uh, yeah. As kidnapper. Yeah, oh, wait, no, or companion getter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you are. I mean, that was really back before the show established the concept of the Doctor and the companion. This was back when the uh, show was uh, organized more or less around the family unit, and they were... They were partly built as an educational program. So, well, I mean, it, it, it was. Cindy Newman had a plan. It just yeah. didn't come to fruition. You, you, you would alternate between science fiction and historical stories, and they eventually dropped the historical part and went solely for science fiction. Yeah, because they didn't go back to historic until... Well, let's see, they did... Uh, Marco, wait, yeah, Marco Polo was the, the, the next real one they did after some sci-fi fantasy stuff. Well, let's see. Uh, yeah, because you've got um, the Daleks, you've got Edge of Destruction. Right. Um, uh, Marco Polo is the fourth, fourth one. The yeah. fifth one is the Keys of Marinus, so that's sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. The sixth one is the Aztecs. The yeah. Aztecs. Um, and then Sensorites. No, sorry. Uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, no, Sensorites. 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 And then... Rain of Terror. Rain of Terror. Is, there you go. Yeah, number eight. We're up to date. We're cool. Yeah. I haven't seen it, so that's full disclosure. It's really awesome. So, um, who's your favorite doctor? That's always a good question to ask. That is extremely difficult because I have a different relationship with each of the doctors. And so, I mean, for, for sheer humor, I've often gone with Tom Baker. And Tom Baker was most prevalent on PBS compared to most of the doctors yeah. during my time. So I grew up a, a lot with Tom Baker. When I reached my, my teens, my high school years and whatnot, I have to say I was incredibly drawn to Sylvester McCoy because Sylvester McCoy was, was the game master. He was the manipulator. He was the person who always knew what was going on. And even though all the doctors before him had been very, very clever, had been very, very cunning and capable. A lot of what they had done was usually 
make up a plan on the moment. But Sylvester McCoy, he was the kind of person whom you have to wonder by the end of the episode if he'd already known all along everything that was going to happen. And you realize just how far in advance a lot of his cunning was. Yeah, he's, he's really the, the, the prototypical for our modern doctor. Yes, in is, many ways. You, know, you look at the first... Yeah, you look at the first six doctors, and they're they're still mild. they have a lot of information. And they know a lot, but they're still they're more very or less human. They're very intelligent, but they're acting on the moment. Yeah, uh, I mean there are notable exceptions depending upon the episode, but by and large, the doctor is using his intelligence to solve problems as they arise. So this McCoy, on the other hand, kind of knew in advance. Yeah, because he was not just playing the game; he was writing the rules for it. Cartnell. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, that was a huge part of Cartnell's yeah. uh, trying to make the, the return a bit more mystery to the yes. Doctor. And large effect what Moffat is doing now by putting emphasis on the fact that, by the way, we don't know who the Doctor is, technically. Doctor. How far do you think he's gonna? How, how far do you think Moffat's gonna go with telling us, or is he just gonna reignite the mystery? Well. In regards to Moffat, uh, one has to assume that we don't have the capability of knowing what he's planning. That he, he's capable of pulling a twist even on the best theory crafters out there. We know that at some point River Song will learn the Doctor's name, and we know that point was not in the episode where he marries her. He, he whispers, look in my eye. And spoilers. Oh, sorry about that. No, 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 no. <laughs> if, you if you haven't seen it by now, it by now watch, watch it. Netflix. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, yeah. So we're still waiting. Everyone, because every, everyone who knew the history of River Song knew that she has come upon this knowledge that nobody else has about the Doctor. And we were waiting for the episode where she would learn this bit of information. And we thought it was this episode until the very end of the episode, and we're like, it hasn't happened yet. No. But then, in that exact same episode, they brought up the importance of, you know, his name. Yeah. And now we are left to wonder exactly, maybe there will be a more... And again, Moffat could pull out any sort of twist at the end. I mean, for me, I tend to think that, in regards to the question, it may be answered, but we, the audience, might not hear the answer. God, I hope not. Well, I mean... It, well, for all we know, is he could have been lying, and that you know, well, River Song told, he could very yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. River Song could have you know been playing by those rules and said Susan's name, her her actual name, because they actually said early on in Classic Who that a human tongue cannot pronounce a Time Lord's name; it, they're just not capable of it. So I mean, once they sort of show that you know River was sort of part Time Lord, that's the reason why she was able to pronounce his name. Even. So it's but like the doctor is all suspect to. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I really wish they would bring more mythology, or not just mythology, but history regarding Susan back into the new series at some point. Well, I think they're hint I mean, I think they've been, I think Moffat's been leaving that breadcrumb trail. I mean, with, with the crib and, you know, the names on the crib, you know, and then always bringing back family. You know, did you have a family? What's going on? So. Yeah, I mean, I was happy that in The Doctor's Daughter, the Doctor mentions that, you know, he has had a family before. And yeah. that kind of reminded everyone that for fans who go way back to the very beginning of the Hartnell years, yeah, they, he was a grandfather, which kind of implies that he had a daughter, not just a granddaughter, right. but a, you know, a son or a daughter or not, so. Yeah, no, and I mean, I, I'll say, listening to the Big Finish special, The Earthly Child, it was really cool to see Carol and Ford interact with McGon's doctor, just because it's... I don't know, I would like to see more interaction between those. Just Carol Ann or any character that Susan interact with the Doctor because, I mean, he goes back to the very beginnings of the show. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the entire concept behind the 11th Doctor, I mean, Moffat said that, you know, for him, the Doctor's personality, his, his manner and such, he, he's supposed to be the kind of... He's supposed to be a grandfatherly character whom all the kids know is really one of them at heart. It just happened that Matt Smith, being the youngest actor ever, managed to capture that personality instead of an older actor that Moffat had wanted. Yeah. And I have to agree, especially after a lot of the uh, uh, Christmas specials where they put a lot of focus on the childhood, that that aspect really comes across. And the Doctor is very much in favor of 
enjoying life in the moment the same way that a kid does. Like, I fixed the bed, I fixed <laughs> the faucets, you know, the lemonade. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, Smith's run because I mean he sold me as a doctor from that very first episode. So since you, since it's hard for you to tell us your favorite uh, doctor, do you have a favorite companion? A favorite companion? Oh, I was very much in love with Ace. <laughs> Sophie Aldred. Sophie Aldred was awesome, and yeah. it worked very well because when Sophie Aldred's tenure on the show was the same time that I was going through high school and whatnot, I related a lot to her character. Uh, so I, w I was very fond of Sophie, and she was smart. She was yeah. straightforward. I mean, they they wanted to try to provide more strength of personality to the companions. I mean, at least going as far back as Sarah Jane Smith, they yeah. really wanted to go ahead and put forward the stronger personality. Sophie Alden really captured that yeah. kind of. And I'm really sad we never got to see what their their plans for Ace were. Oh, I know. Because she, she only had about three more stories before they they were gonna she was gonna depart, and basically they, he was gonna drop her off on Gallifrey. To uh, go through the, the the college schooling there to become a time lord. As far as we are aware, through the Sarah Jane Adventures, um, the Ace has set up a charitable organization yeah. called uh, a Charitable Earth and whatnot. And, and Sophie said, "I would love to see it because if that that kind of does effectively establish her in the current continuity, that they could always have a, a, her show up, which I would love." Well, the, th the plan was she was going to show up in Sarah Jane Adventures before Elizabeth Slater died, yeah. uh, but I was never able to find a plot synopsis. It was just they had worked it out because I would have loved to have seen the concept in which they actually brought her into the show. What I would really love to see is uh, the return of Barbara and Ian, because they have been established as having never aged. Uh, interesting thing they used to say Barbara and Ian. I was looking through the latest episode or the latest Doctor Who magazine, um, and of course it's following the adventures of Matt Smith. But he actually, the last panel of, of the comic is him meeting Barbara and Ian. I don't know if this is pre-doctor, post-doctor, because it's just like, hi, we're Ian and Barbara. Hello, you know. Are so, they a couple? It's, you don't the, know. it's in the classroom. I mean, it's like he's at yeah. the And there's still a like Cambridge like, in the modern timeline, yeah. so, you know, anything's possible. Yeah, but I'm really curious about how they're actually going to pull that off, because, I mean, I really hope they do get at least William uh, Russell, and, is. Yeah, Russell back, because he's still alive, whereas, sadly, the actress that played Barbara is not. So, what are you looking forward to out of the 50th anniversary? I would like to see an homage to much of the history of the show and the Doctor's character and all the development he's been through. And I would like to see... It, it's difficult because there's so many aspects of Doctor Who, so many different points that they pursued throughout the series. I mean, everything from redemption to entropy to family. Uh, there, there's so... I mean, every season focused on differing concepts and the Doctor himself has just always been such a grandfatherly figure throughout the show. On one hand, I really want to see the Doctor find some sort of peace with the tragedy that he's always, that he's been through, as far as not just with the Time Lords, but the fact that even before the show began, he's traveling with his granddaughter, but we know nothing about the rest of his family. I know that there's... For him, he's... he's, he's throughout much of the series so far, it's been hinted that he's looking for forgiveness which he ultimately can never receive. Uh, going back to the Neil Gaiman episode of The Doctor's Wife, and Amy Pond commenting that what you're looking for is forgiveness, and he's like, well, isn't that what everyone's looking for? I would like the 50th episode to be something for him. The Doctor has spent centuries helping other people. It would be nice to see an episode where something happens for him. Best way is he gets to see his granddaughter again. Maybe. So, do you have any favorite moments? Because I mean, you've you you've spanned you have pretty much spanned the history of Who. Do you have any like those any favorite moments throughout the uh, history of the show? Classic new Who, just favorite moments. Oh. I mean, there were certain episodes I was always exceedingly fond of, and there were always specific moments that were particularly funny or memorable. I remember Tom Baker on uh, 
on Vega, uh, the, the Planet of Gold, this, I forget the name of the episode, but it, with the Cybermen, the Fourth Doctor. Is it is either Attack or Revenge of the Cybermen? I always get that It one may confused. have been Revenge of the Cybermen, because they were going to blow up the Planet of Gold. No, they're the Vog Vogons. Vog yes. And they tied these bombs, and one of the best moments, because one of, the, one of the, uh, the companions who had a very short tenure was right at the start of the Tom Baker era was uh, Harry Sullivan. Harry, Harry. I mean, he was. This, I mean, he was essentially comic relief, as if extra comic relief was really needed. Sorry, Doctor, Doctor Harry Sullivan. Doctor Harry Sullivan, yes. and and that was part of it. And they, there came a point when Harry is trying to help the Doctor by removing this bomb. Harry is not aware that the bomb is going to go off if he removes it, and the Doctor stops him. He's like, Harry, did you cause the cave-in? Yes, Doctor. Uh, did you try to remove this bomb? Well, well yes. Uh, Harry Sullivan is an imbecile! He just shouts it. Yes. And everyone I've known who watched the episode has remembered that one particular moment. Because it was just a perfect comedy of characterization between the Doctor's relationship and Harry Sullivan's relationship. He means so well, and yet Harry Sullivan just... Team actually quite a bit. We got like four or five really good episodes with them. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, they had an excellent serial. That, uh, I mean, meta serial, so to speak. Uh, they carried through that. The, the arc cycle, if I remember what it was Yeah, with called. the, um, with, um, not Narada, the Nerva, Nerva Station. Yeah. So, uh, Which is actually interesting enough. That's the uh, that's the spaceship in the first use, and uh, they go back to in the first uh, the first Tom Baker uh, Big Finish audio. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, that makes good sense. Yeah, cool. I, yeah, I've got to catch up with the audios. Yeah, the Baker stuff's really really interesting. But the sad thing is, at times he doesn't sound like Baker anymore. Mm. But I mean, a lot of times he does. But then once in a while, it's like. You know, you hear this guy talking, and then it just clicks. And it's Baker. I mean, hmm. so. So, do you have any questions for uh, Philip? No, you've done a really good job covering them. Obviously, we're, we're dealing with a fan here. It's, I'm always very envious of people who remember what their childhood with Doctor Who was like. Because I watched it, but you know, we didn't have a television growing up. So when I watched Doctor Who, I watched it at my friends' houses. So I never watched full stories ever. Oh, so yeah. I, I have no concept of what my first. I have a real strong vision of Stones of Blood, maybe the first oh. time I watched that, which is a great yeah. episode, or, or a great two two parter. But um, but yeah, like, I don't my, you know, I have to come to terms with the fact that my first real Doctor Who experience, television wise, was the the '96 movie because I I kept up with Doctor Who. I watched single episodes. I read the comic um, a lot, so you know, like I can't remember now. Now I can't remember my her name, but my first companion that I remember is um, the one that Dave Gibbons drew, uh, the Doctor's technically first black companion. I cannot remember her name at the moment, but uh, there's a great series of fourth Doctors. I mean, the, the Doctor was a very important part of my childhood because uh, he served, I mean, you, I mean, you, you latch onto role models growing Absolutely. up, and for me, the Doctor was one of those role models, and I, I looking back now, I, I seem to have a pattern amongst them, because... This is my, there you are. he was my role model, in a lot of ways, Davison. He still me. wears vegetables on his clothing, it's, it's <laughs> fun. I do, just not right now. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I latch onto role models like Sherlock Holmes and the Doctor, and these were characters who were exceptionally brilliant, and yet, especially in the case of the Doctor, they... They not only had a sense of responsibility, but they had a very creative sense of responsibility. They, yeah. they took the time to remember that they needed to enjoy what was going on around them. And that it was not, especially for a kid going through school, that being smart and intelligent was something to be exalted and not embarrassed by. Yeah. And that was exceptionally important for me. And I mean, to this day, I keep watching Matt Smith and David Tennant and Chris Ravison, and I was really worried about the new series. Because uh, I fell into the category of people who liked the 1996 movie, but I had certain nitpicky issues with it. What, do you think he'd need to be half human on his mother's side and yeah. kissing girls? Well, I was not necessarily opposed to the idea of pushing a romantic aspect to the Doctor so long as it's done very, very carefully. Yeah. But making him half human is like... the, the He's not Spock. He's not, no. 
The doctor is alien. The companion is our medium through which to relate to the doctor. We don't need the doctor to be made half human to relate to him. The doctor represents the ideal we strive towards. Well, the doctor so lies, so we don't. Yeah. And there's that too. And, but it just makes it much more interesting because it's just like you have Superman whose commentary on human culture and whatnot is received through his characterization of Clark Kent. We don't need Superman to actually be human in right. order to relate to him. The doctor, we don't need him to be hu human in any way, shape, or form in order for us to relate to him. We can look at him and see how he views us to get a better understanding of ourselves. And I was really worried when I, when I saw that the new series had been brought back in 2005. I was nervous because I wasn't sure how they would treat the Doctor. Would they, would they treat it as a true continuation of the old series? Would they have remade it with a creative reinterpretation of many of the aspects of the classic series? I was really, and, and, and above all, would they really be retaining that kind of manic, grandfatherly, fun, yet intelligent, you know, I mean, every Doctor has a different personality, but there are certain core principles behind it uh, that they have maintained throughout. And I was worried that they were not going to be able to recapture that. And I, I finally sat down and I watched Silence in the Library with David Tennant. It's nothing to worry about. And it was reassuring that they had gotten it right. That was your first, first new Who? That was my first new Who, Silence in the Library. <laughs> and the first thing I saw was, here is this thin guy with glasses wearing a blue suit. He looked like a person I could see in a, in a classroom mm -hmm. as a teacher. And he was excited about books. And I was like, I can see it. I, I can see that this is a, and, and that, that slight madness to him, yet that reverence for intelligence and knowledge. I could see where they had latched on and they had captured the core principles. It, it was his own personality. He was distinctly, David Tennant's doctor, the 10th doctor, is distinctly his own personality, but he had managed to continue with the same core concepts behind what makes the doctor the doctor. Yeah. And in that regard, I felt reassured. I mean, even though Science and Library, for me, was a somewhat dark episode, and no pun intended. Ah, uh, um, it wasn't that dark. <laughs> um, but it still retained yeah. everything that I was looking for in Doctor Who. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, big, big fan of that one. So, Phil, I, I know you're an artist, and you do lots of really cool graphical arty things. Is there anything you want to plug? Anything that's coming up? You know, any uh, plug yourself? Uh, well, I do two web comics, which are currently on hiatus as I develop. For me, web comics is kind of a hobby, and it's my medium for not only learning how to draw, but also for how to do web design and such. But I have a website called Projects Done Right, with right being my last name, W-R-I-G-H-T. And that is where that site serves as a, uh, a jump page to all my other projects that I do. What I'm actively doing at the moment are art assets for a virtual tabletop uh, service called Roll20.net. And what Roll20.net does is they allow tabletop uh, RPGs to be played over the internet, either through their website or through Google Hangouts. And they provide GMs and players everything they need. And what I've been doing is I've been creating art assets that allows GMs to create maps. Uh, for all their adventures. So if you have, uh, you know, heroes fighting goblins in the forest, I have the terrain tiles that allow for people to make the maps for them. So, so that's what I'm currently engaged in. Cool. That's incredibly useful, and, and as a GM, I, I applaud you and appreciate your efforts. <laughs> Uh, so I think that pretty much wraps up this uh, sort of uh, fan uh, interview, uh, professional interview uh, with Philip uh, about uh, Doctor Who and his fandom with it. So this is uh, GPR signing up. Peace.